Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Chickasha First, where hope is found. My name is Julie, and me and Pastor Chad are the lead pastors here, and we are thankful you've chosen us this morning. I know that there's hundreds of churches out there that you could have clicked on this morning on your computer, on your cell phone, on your tablet, but we're thankful you chose us. So welcome. Welcome to Chickasha First. But before we get into worship this morning, I would like for you to take your cell phones and please text someone a greeting. Someone that you would usually see on Sunday morning at church and say, good morning, God bless you, I'm thinking about you, I'm praying for you. But also, text someone that you know should be in church with you or should be attending, attending a church. Text that person also and tell them, hey, here's, what, here's the website to my church, here's what they're doing on Sunday morning, I'd love for you to join us. It's important that in the midst of all this quarantine, we don't forget about each other and that we are also very intentional in making connections with one another. Once again, thanks for joining Chickasha First, where hope is found. Is I reflect, I find perspective in the best and worst days of this life you were always on my side you're in the pain you're in the promise and on the days the furnace finds my faith you're the fourth within the flame i don't need to know Cause if the past could talk, it would tell me this and my God isn't finished yet If He did it before, He can do it again So I trust in what comes next For the God I know is known for faithfulness And my hindsight says I can trust Him with what comes next There's more ahead than what's behind me Cause through the highs and lows and in between God, you go ahead of me And where you call me, I will follow And if the water falls beneath my feet Then you'll pull me from the deep I don't need to know what the future says Cause if the past could talk, it would tell me this and my God isn't finished yet If He did it before, He can do it again So I trust in what comes next For the God I know is known for faithfulness In my heart's I says I can trust in with what comes next for the God I know is known for faithfulness, you know. Trust in what comes next Cause my hindsight says I can count on this And my God isn't finished yet If He did it before He can do it again So I trust in what comes next For the God I know is known for faithfulness And my hindsight says I can trust in with what comes next
hands that created the heavens find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars you pull me from the clay you set me on a rock and call me by your Lift it up on my knees, no all for your glory That I might stand with more reasons to sing than to fear You pull me from the clay You send me on a rock Once I was broken, 
Lord Father, thank you so much for this time of worship, Lord Father. I just thank you for speaking to us this morning, Lord. I just pray that you uh, speak to everybody listening this morning, Lord Father. And I pray that we apply your word to our lives, Lord Father. I pray these things in your name. Amen. in the street minding my own business when this this body came down out of the window onto the street right in front of me well I was supposed to be at work that day I might have called in sick you know how it is sometimes you just need a day off but anyway my wife started screaming she was in a terrible panic and well I really didn't know what to do but I started to walk over and you know, as I started to walk where he was laying, a man came out of the door. He grabbed the dead boy up. He said something, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. The crowd started to gather by then. So Paul was talking and talking and talking, and it was getting late. I was sitting near Eutychus, and I could tell he was getting tired because his eyes were getting heavy. And I just, well, never expected anything like this to happen. He fell out of the window. I told Paul he might want to watch the time. He tends to go a little long. He had been talking for hours by the time Eutychus fell asleep, and well... <sighs> we hadn't even had dinner yet, but poor guy, he couldn't stay awake. It was another half an hour before we got to eat. I was the first one down the steps and outside right after Paul. He just wrapped Eutychus in his arms and laid on top of him. The crowd had gathered around him outside and he told them that he was okay. I just couldn't believe it. Eutychus opened his eyes and he sat up like nothing had ever happened. He didn't even have a scratch on him. I had seen disciples of the way heal people who had been sick for a long time or blind their whole life. But this one was an emergency. This kid was dead. And then he wasn't? What I heard was that he used to persecute the Christians. Then he was saved by Jesus, filled with the Spirit of God and compassion for the very people that he had persecuted. I probably shouldn't have been sitting in the windowsill, but it was a warm spring day, and I didn't know that Paul would go on and on like he did. And I was comfortable. A little too comfortable, I guess. It all happened so fast. I was about to go over and tell my son to wake up. But I really didn't want to call attention to him or to me, and I thought surely Paul would take a break soon. He had been talking for hours. He would surely have to stop for supper. But suddenly, Eutychus fell from the window out onto the street. I was horrified. I ran for the door, but Paul had gotten there first. And when I got to the street, he had my son in his arms and my boy was looking around and asking what had happened. We've been traveling a lot and stopped for a week's visit in Troas. Who knows when we'll be back here, so Paul wanted to keep talking. But I suggested we eat first. After all, it was after midnight. When we had finished with dinner, Paul went back to talking and he didn't wrap it up until daybreak. When we'd finished eating, Paul resumed his speech. He talked until daybreak, and then we headed back home. We were so thankful and beside ourselves with joy to be taking our Eutychus home with us alive. This guy, Paul, he must be living right. Hey, thanks for joining us. Uh, we are honored and delighted that you chose to click on our uh, social media platform today to worship with us in service. Uh, our worship team did an incredible job today, and uh, we are honored and delighted that you clicked on to check us out. This is the last sermon in our sermon series, The Grave, where we've looked at at least five, or today's the fifth, uh, fifth 
time in the New Testament where somebody is raised from the dead. And so if you have your Bibles today, if you'll turn to Acts chapter 20, um, I, I do want to give you a heads up. Uh, this is the last one. We're, we're having a new sermon series starting next week, and so uh, I, I want to make sure that you're anticipating uh, the, the name on that sermon series is Transformations, and we'll be looking at Paul's words to the Roman church in Romans chapter 12. And so I'm excited about that. It should be fun and exciting as we get into it. Uh, but th- again, that's next week. We'll start that up, and we'll go for a couple weeks on transformations. Transformations. But today, Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12, and it reads this way. Uh, Luke records uh, a Paul in his, in his missionary journey. On the first day of the week, when they had gathered together to break bread, Paul talked to them. Intending to depart on the next day, he prolonged his speech until midnight. And there were many lamps in the upper room that were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus was sitting at a window sank into a deep sleep as Paul still talked longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down, bent over him, and taking him in his arms said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and broken bread and eaten it, he conversed with them a little while longer until daybreak and so departed. And then they took the youth away alive and were not a little comforted. Can we pray today? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you today for every man, woman, and child under the sound of my voice that is watching this service online today. Lord, I pray that no matter where they find themselves, whether it be in a car or on a couch or in a lazy boy, or, or, or maybe just as they take a morning stroll, Lord, I, fi- I pray that as they find themselves in this moment, may, they, may your Holy Spirit pierce their heart. Pierce their heart and reminder that no matter what their expectations have been, Lord, no matter what they want things to happen and the way they want it to happen, Father, you are still a God who is actively involved in our issues and circumstances. And so, Father, I pray today that you'd open our ears to hear, our mind to understand, and our heart to receive all that your word would speak to us today, that just because expectations aren't met, Lord, there is still ministry to be done. And Lord, I thank you today that, Lord, we have a great opportunity to join with hundreds, if not thousands of people that have never had an opportunity to hear us. Lord, may they hear your word be the first and foremost thing that they hear. And Lord, I thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I, I don't know what birthdays are like for your family. I, I don't know how you celebrate. I, I don't know even if you celebrate. And to be frank, uh, at the beginning of my marriage, I really didn't have an idea of celebrating birthdays. Uh, matter of fact, birthdays are a big deal in our home. Uh, I, I have my wife and my two daughters, and, and uh, early on in our marriage, I struggled with making sure I, I celebrated my wife, and certainly struggled with making sure my daughters were celebrated appropriately. But I, I think I can say with some assurance I've I've changed over the years. Uh, Birthdays are just a big deal in our home. It's important that we make people feel important. It's important that uh, we make the birthday person feel like they are the greatest thing since sliced bread. And so over the years, we've adopted this idea that we will do whatever it takes to make sure the birthday birthday person feels most loved. Now, it, it doesn't necessarily happen on the day that somebody was actually born, but we take time to make sure somebody feels celebrated. Now, along with that, a few years ago, roughly five years ago, my wife and I were at another church, and we'd only been there about 18 months. And so we were still developing relationships, we were still developing friendships, and uh, I'll never forget, uh, it was in a really busy season. We were were in the process of of starting a a major capital campaign, and we knew that we needed a a lot of buy-in at this moment, and so uh, we knew it was a little high stress but we, we trusted that God was going to take us through it. And my wife's birthday was on the calendar. And now knowing that my wife's birthday was on the calendar and knowing that I had a, a responsibility to make sure that she was going to be taken care of, I, uh, I arranged the perfect birthday 
excursion. Now, it wasn't probably a great celebration. It probably wasn't the, the best thing I could have ever done. But at the time in our life, and finances were tight, and we had two small children, I did the best with what I had. I, I had secured a, a babysitter for the evening's activities. I, I, I had already scheduled the reservations at the restaurant. I had our movie tickets purchased, and I had already making, made sure that the car was swept out, vacuumed, and the presents were placed appropriately. And so we took off about two hours away from our house, and so we went to her favorite restaurant, we enjoyed a meal together, we flirted with one another, we just had a good time. We, we forgoed uh, uh, the dessert because we needed to make our, our, our way to the movie theater because uh, for whatever reasons, my wife loves movies. I, I think it's because popcorn is her secret drug. Uh, but whatever the case, when we showed up, we, we got the little snacks that are needed to go in the movie theater. The Warren Theater in Broken Arrow is where we ended up. It was at the time the only theater in the area that had the reclining seats that you could turn on the heater. And so it was the perfect setup. She was on her birthday. She's had her favorite meal. She's got her favorite snacks. Uh, we're sitting down to do her favorite thing, watch movies in, the, in our favorite theater, eating, seating in our favorite seats. And we're watching her favorite series of, of movies, sci-fi, where she can forget this real-life world and just focus on the, re, the uh, fairy tales that may be. And so we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, I, I get a text. Now, it's not uncommon as a pastor for me to get texts. It's, it's certainly a, a pretty common occurrence. But this particular text was from a, a dear board member of our church, and his father had fallen ill. His father was a stalwart of the, the church that we were a part of. And the sex didn't say a whole lot. Matter of fact, uh, it, it, it left, a, left a pretty grim respect. And it was very short and sweet to the point. It simply said, took dad to the ER, don't look good, I'll talk to you tomorrow. i, I got to be honest, in that moment, I, I begin to question exactly what I should do. Should I let my wife know that this board member texted me? Should I just play it off until the end of the movie and then go and, and inform her? Should I just ignore it? Because the, obviously the, the board member had been very clear, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. And I just had this sinking feeling I, I, needed, to, I needed to at least let her know what was going on. So I, I simply handed my phone to her, and she read it. Now, before I could even gather what was taking place, I, I think I was a little focused on the movie, thinking that maybe she would just uh, forego wanting to move in that moment. Uh, she, she gathered her things, and she made her way for the door. And I, I remember her looking back up at me as I'm watching her walk down the steps and all of a sudden me kind of being disheveled like I I need to do something I, I need to make my movement and so I remember hurrying scuttling and making my way down and out of the theater and so uh, I'll, I'll never forget as I was looking at her and she was looking at me and she said what's taking you so long and I said well babe I, I just didn't know if you you wanted to to go and she said well Chad interruptions are ministry you know, we, we arrived at the hotel or at the hospital uh, some two hours later. We prayed with the family and we sat down with the, with the son and eventually would pray for the father. And it was in that, that moment we were reminded that, that people always come first, that interruptions are our ministry. It was an integral moment in our time at our last church that we showed up in that moment we there had been some rumors and whispers of that people felt like maybe we were trying to move forward too fast with our remodel we we didn't care what the people were going through and we were more concerned about building things and doing things and and it just seemed like after this moment that we showed up at the hospital and was there for this family in their time of need because interruptions are ministry that all those whispers begin to subside all those rumors begin to just be quieted. Why? Because interruptions are ministry. Now, interruptions are never convenient. They, they never seem to come at an opportune time. They never have a way of coming at the perfect moment. No, interruptions are the exact opposite. They have an idea of coming at the worst possible moment, at the most inconvenient times, at never the right time. That's what makes them interruptions. 
Now, I'm not saying that I would always forego my wife's birthday. I, I do believe that moment was divinely led between the two of us, that we agreed in our spirit that we needed to go. And yes, I do believe in rest, and we need to take time to celebrate our family. And we've always made it a, a principal moment in our household to spend time with one another. But in this particular moment, at this particular time, we were both impressed by the Holy Spirit that interruptions are our ministry. And so these moments in your life where your life has been interrupted. Now, it has been interrupted, right? Like everything you knew as normal 60 days ago is not normal anymore. Man, your life has been interrupted in the sense that uh, the expectations that you had, they, they no longer exist, that it is completely and utterly not the same your your life has been interrupted now i i know for you your interruptions used to be things like your kids knocking on the door at 7 a.m on a saturday morning just when you thought they would finally sleep in or 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 maybe it was an annoying psa that would come on the television and interrupt your favorite television show just to inform you that they were checking the emergency communications But the reality is the interruptions that you're currently facing as people, as a person, as a household, as a family, you never anticipated this interruption. It could be interruptions such as losing your your job. It, It could be the interruption of not knowing how to, like, teach your kids it could be a, 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 a drastic interruption of maybe you have a family member who is right now in the hospital and is facing some serious issues. You, you are being interrupted in this very moment and you feel disheveled. You feel, you feel messed up. Your expectations aren't being met and it's caused a stir craziness within your spirit. These interruptions that we've experienced, these interruptions that we're having to go through, they can certainly be divine moments where we as a church, where we as Christ followers, where we as a people can be led into ministry and opportunities that we never thought possible before. Why? Because interruptions are ministry. So instead of bemoaning the fact or being upset that things have changed And things have happened to you. Can we take but a moment and pause and reflect on Scripture today where interruptions happened in the midst of what was going on and it literally become a divine moment for ministry to take place that superseded the, the original expectation. So, let's ponder for a moment Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12 again. Now, Paul... He's on a great missionary adventure, and he is making himself on his way back to Jerusalem. He wants to be in Jerusalem before Pentecost. And so I, 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 I'm not saying it's a it's super big deal. I'm not saying it's a, a, a divine moment. I just don't believe in coincidences. I, I believe that God's got his fingerprint in lots of things. And so there are some historians that actually feel the date of this particular service or this particular moment that we're reflecting in Acts chapter 20 is right around 27 AD on April 24th. Now, I know that's just a few days ago, but how cool is it how close we are to the story of this taking place some 2,000 years ago? Anyways, Paul has made his way into this city, Troas, and he he has made his way to hang out, and he's doing something that he has in common with most of us. He's found himself at a church service. Now, I, I do want to highlight some very particular things that uh, kind of show the interruptions even of those early Christians. Now according to the Diachi, it was a, a formal writing. It was like a it's like a script on how to plant a church. Uh, the Diachi was written around 85 to 95 AD and so this is going to be some 60 or 70 years after this moment of Paul but the Diachi recorded that they, all the Christians needed to meet on the first of the week and so that would be defined as Sunday. 
But a Jewish person would meet on Saturday. They would celebrate the Sabbath. And so this is the first time in the New Testament where we find that, that Paul wants to meet on the first of the week, which tells us these Christians that are meeting with Paul, they, they've been interrupted from their normal schedule of, re, of relationship and religion with God. They, their, their Sabbath time that they spent, their, their, their normal process where they go to the synagogue and they, they would celebrate and worship God and, and read the Torah, that normalcy has totally been thrown out the window. The, the interruption of having to meet service at a different time, they find themselves at night. Now, anytime, particularly when you read in Paul and John both, and they mention the word night, it has a, a reference or it has an idea to it that, that includes a, a, cloud, a cloud of mystery or almost, almost like it's, it's oppressed, like you're trying to hide, keep from being found. It's, it's super secretive. It's, it's done under the cover of darkness. And so Paul actually, or, or Luke makes light or points out in, to enlighten us to the fact that the church is meeting at night so that no one really knows what's going on. Now, they tried to make it as bright as possible, but the brightness is only taking place in the room itself. Uh, if you would, uh, on this uh, April evening, uh, if tonight when you go out, it, it could be 70 or 80 degrees during the day, but in the evening, it's probably 60 to 70. And can you imagine a room filled with lit candles or lit kerosene lanterns or, or something that had lots of fire to it? Now, I know I'm surrounded by light bulbs that uh, allow me to have an angelic glow, but uh, I'm talking about real fire in an enclosed room. It would be kind of stuffy. It would be a, a little... A little stinky. It, it would not be like the synagogue that would be an open-air forum where people could converse with one another freely and free from what would be happening around them. It would be during the day and it would be shown to everyone, no, this church kind of meets in the privacy of a stuffy room because they, they want to keep it kind of secret. They don't want everybody to know what's going on. They, they want to kind of protect themselves to some degree. And so Paul is there to share in the Eucharist with him. Now, the Eucharist is a really fancy Christian word, and so if you're not a Christ follower today, just know that Eucharist simply means communion. You may not know what the communion is. It's this act when Christians, they, they break bread or they drink juice, and they remember what Christ did for us, that he went to a cross and he died for us, he was buried and, and risen again in resurrection, and the act of taking communion, the act of taking bread and, and juice, reminds us of what Jesus did for us. And so uh, this moment, Paul is there, and he's teaching, and he's preaching, and he's there to actually have the Eucharist. Now, I, I don't know about you, but uh, there have been some moments in my life I wish some preachers would shut up, and you might be thinking that today about me. Um, but Paul has probably been preaching for at least four hours at this point, and he's still yet to share in the Eucharist. He's still yet to break the bread and drink the juice. He has not done that yet, and that was really the reason why he was there. He was there to break the bread with these, these Christians in Troas. And so as this stuffy room that's hot, that's lit up with a bunch of people that might be a little stinky, there's a young man, somewhere between the age of 20 and 40. He's, he's uh, probably not married, doesn't have kids, but he's got a family, and so he finds himself in the best possible situation. He sees a window that is opened, and he's going to go sit by it to get some fresh air. I've, I've been in these circumstances. I've, I've been in these meetings before where I just got to say I got to go to the bathroom or I've got to get to the outside edges or I've, I've got to kind of get away from what's going on just because I'm either going to pass out or I'm, I'm going to go to sleep. And so this man, he makes his way to the window and he begins to sit. And, and, and again, Paul is going on and 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 on. So much so, the young man falls asleep and falls out of the window. Now, if you haven't been raised in church, there are sermons that are like that. They go on forever and you either wish death or sleep, because those are the only best two options. 
Uh, I've been a part of those. I hope you don't consider that this one today. But this is what happens to the young man. He, he falls out of the window, three stories, and he dies. So you kind of get the sense when this young man falls out of the window that there are probably some family in the upper room. I, I can just see a, 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 a wife, or not a wife, but a, a mother that's hysterical, that her baby boy, oh, Johnny Feller, and actually his name is Eucly- uh, uh, Eutychus. Eutychus fell out of the window, we gotta get Eutychus. Well, a side note, the name Eutychus means lucky one. So can you kind of put that in context? The, the lucky one fell out of the window because Paul was preaching too long. Uh, Whatever the case may be, Eutychus falls out, family freaks out, they're all upset. And so Paul, in the midst of his like four-hour-long discourse, has to stop. Now, Scripture records, as Luke says, they make their way down, and it says that they they pick up the young man. They, they, They take up the dead man. Now, Luke is a doctor by trade, and so if Luke records the young man is dead, he's dead. I know there would be some in their theological presentation of of this portion of Scripture, they would simply say the young man got knocked out. But why would we take Luke at his words every time, other time that he's been a doctor, and this time not include the fact that he's a doctor? Luke records the young man is dead. And so they kind of pick the young man up, and he just falls back down into this jelly mess. He just falls indiscreetly upon the ground not being able to move because his body is dead now this situation of this young man falling out of this street story building he has totally interrupted everything that paul had planned I mean, maybe Paul has planned on doing a prayer service. Eventually, he's going to do the Eutychus. But this whole thing is completely thrown out because this young man has interrupted everything I don't know what's going through Paul's head. I don't know what he's pondering this moment. I don't know how he's taking this moment. But something inside of him says, I, 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 I need to do something. And so scripture records that Paul bent down, and, and literally the, the, the Greek there is he lays himself upon the young man, which is even a strange thought put, put in perspective. It's, it's a strange idea that, that Paul, this young man is laid there dead, and he's not moving, and Paul lays down on him. Now, Paul is a, is a Pharisee by trade, and so he's been trained in the Old Testament, knows, knows the Old Testament verse line and sinker, knows everything by heart. And so he would be reminded of both Elisha and Elijah where they would lay on dead young men and pray God resurrect them from the dead. So maybe that's immediately what the Holy Spirit quickened Paul's heart to. Maybe in that moment, just a snap of a button, a snap of a moment, uh, Paul goes, hey, I need to lay on this kid, and I'm going to pray that he get up. And so Paul lays on him. Paul gets up, taking the young man in his arms. He says, hey, don't be alarmed. His life's with him. He's alive. There have been a lot of interruptions in your life these last couple weeks. There's been a lot of interruptions in your life that that you feel like you're dead. You, You feel like all life has ceased to be, that it has escaped you the possibility of ever being successful again. And in a moment in, in our life, it, it, we, we, we come to a, a holy moment like this. We come to a, a church service online, and it just feels like the pastor and preacher just puts a little more pressure on you. It feels like he's just laying a little more, laying a little thicker on you. Can I, can I tell you today what the pastor and what the preacher is trying to communicate to you is let hope uh, rest in your soul. Let hope uh, lay in your life. Let the interruption of your circumstance be brought on with the ministry that Jesus wants to do in your life. That he, he wants to resurrect the dead thing in your life so that you can have a, a testimony of what God is wanting to do in and through you like you've never had before. You, you, you have been interrupted. You have been, you have been torn up. You've been cast out of the third story window and everything seems like it's falling apart and, and it just seems like Jesus Jesus, though interrupted, wants to do some ministry. Matter of fact, the flippant words have been said in the middle of your interruption. Oh, like, you're going to make it. God's going to carry you through. Uh, some flippant words in, in your heart, at least what you think. It just seems like pastors are just flippantly saying, it's, it's okay. It, it may be tough. It may be rough in this moment, but God's going to sustain you. And you may be thinking, that's, that's not enough. I wonder what this young man's family thought as Paul lays on him and says, now, 
I'm going to pick him up. Don't be alarmed. He's not dead. And what's even crazier, Paul picks him up and says he's not dead. He hands him to his, father, or to, his, to his family, and then Paul goes upstairs and then finally decides to break the bed. It's almost as if, like, Paul really wasn't affected by the interruption, but in the interruption is when the ministry actually happened. Notice that after they broke bread, he conversed with them a little while longer. In verse 12, they took the youth away, and they were not a little comforted. That idea of little comforted, they were comforted above and beyond anything they could hope, dream, or imagine. Luke didn't have the adequate expression to, to convey to the audience that was reading this how comforted they were because their son, uncle, nephew, their their cousin was resurrected from the dead, that it was such a comfort to them that it totally transformed their life. Their interruption had ministry involved. Uh, today, you may be in the middle of the interruption, and it's not some flippant words that this pastor is saying to you that you're going to make it. God's with you. He'll sustain you. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. For though you may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you can fear no evil. Those aren't flippant words. Those are words of affirmation that God is on your side today. You may have been interrupted, but there is still hope for joy comes in the morning. Keep pressing on. Keep walking. Keep doing the things that God has called you to do for your day is not over yet. You may be interrupted, but God wants to do ministry in your life. And the second part of that is it may seem like in the midst of interruption, you don't know what to do. Paul didn't throw his hands in the air and say, God, I can't believe this happens to me. I'm preaching and I'm just doing what you want. You had some kid fall asleep and fall out of the window. No, God, Paul wasn't afraid of that. Paul wasn't offended by that. He just did what he knew he needed to do. He needed to raise the kid from the dead. There's some of you even now. There's been some interruptions that have happened in your life, and you, you're looking at them going, I don't know why that happened. Why, how come it happened that way? And God's just telling you, in a divine confidence, look to him. Let that interruption become your ministry. I know for me and my wife, one of the interruptions that we're having to face right now is the fact that we're having to homeschool our children. It's not fun. I think every teacher, and I said this before this happened, needs a raise. Uh, there's been two times in my life I have, I have uh, been a uh, substitute teacher. One time was at a junior high, and, and, and I almost left a murderer. The second time was at a high school, and I decided never to do both again. I'm, I'm not necessarily a classroom teacher. My wife would tell you, she is not a classroom teacher. Matter of fact, we have a little running joke in our family right now. I'm the teacher and she's the principal. In these moments, we, we, this is not what we signed up for. Our life has been interrupted by the fact we're having to teach our girls. But here's where the ministry takes place. I have spent more time with my two daughters in the last three weeks than I probably have in the last three years. Matter of fact, I've had some really cool moments. If you want to check us out, uh, on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, we have something called Wash with Soap. It's a little devotional that we throw on Facebook that you're welcome to check out. But it's just me and my daughters having a conversation about Scripture that, that I probably, as a father, have failed up until this point. I haven't really shared moments of devotion with them probably the way that I should. And so the interruption, them being with me and not leaving my side and me having to teach them, I've turned it into ministry. It's kind of been kind of cool. Do you realize the interruptions that you're facing right now may be the very divine interruptions that God has allowed to take place so that you can be the minister that God's called you to be? Now, you may be sitting in your recliner today, that a good old lazy boy, and you may be thinking to yourself, I don't need to be a minister. That's what you're for, preacher. Well, that's not Jesus' words. And Jesus' words that once we get saved, once we make a commitment to follow him with all of our heart, soul, and mind, we're to go make more disciples. What's that word? Go, go do ministry. Matter of fact, Paul tells the church of Ephesus, hey, your job as the minister of the gospel, well, he's talking to pastors and preachers, he says your job as a minister of the gospel is to equip the saints for ministry. 
well, what's the ministry word? To do good works. You, you do not get an excuse in the middle of COVID-19, the good old corona. You don't get an excuse not to do ministry. Matter of fact, the very interruptions that are a part of your life may be the very divine moments of ministry that God has set you up for. You may think to yourself, well, Pastor, what am I? I don't know what to do. Sure you do. We had a little bit of a moment last week when you took out your phone and you scrolled through your contacts and, and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit quickened a person in your heart and you, you texted them. That was, that was ministry. I, I got a text message that Sunday afternoon from somebody in our church who texted somebody and ended up being a, a soldier somewhere. And the person just texted back, hey, just let you know, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and pray for you today. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. How, how incredible it is. Maybe that soldier was in a moment wondering if anybody cared, if anybody thought of him, if anybody was even concerned about him. And he got a text message from some person in Grady County that says, hey, I'm, I'm praying for you today. Don't tell me interruptions aren't ministry. What about Walmart? We're surrounded with mass panic. What if while you're checking out, and you're six feet back, of course, because you social distancing, what if God just lays it upon your heart as the woman runs back because she forgot bread, you just hand her your bread? Or, or better yet, what if you don't freak out that she went to go get it? And while she's away, you tell the cashier, hey, I want to go ahead and I want to go ahead and purchase their food. Don't tell me that interruptions aren't ministry because God is setting you up for something incredible. God is going to use you to impact people in such a way there isn't even words to express how thankful they are. That they go away well above comforted. Why? Because interruptions are ministry. The resuscitation of life for this young man, for Eutychus' life, was because an interruption allowed for ministry to take place. So, will you allow interruptions to be your ministry? Will you allow in this time of Corona 2020, when everything seems to be spun, when everything seems to be flipped upside down, Will you rest in the fact that God is still in charge and he still wants to use us very imperfect beings to do his perfect work? And what is that? To show the love of Jesus to all those who are around. Would you do something with me today? Would you simply bow your head no matter where you find yourself? And I, I have an honest question to ask you this morning. Here in a moment, uh, as you watch this, There'll be a, a little button you can click if you're watching on online.church. And maybe you're not watching on online. Maybe you're watching Facebook or YouTube. If you could simply send a message, if today you want to belong to a community such as this that believes that Jesus is going to impact us in an incredible way. That you today want to make a commitment that Jesus is moving in your life. That Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. And though your life has been interrupted, though your life has had some very serious issues, Jesus is saying to you today, I, I never want to leave you, I never want to forsake you, that you can lean into Jesus today because he wants to minister to your life. With your head bowed, and that would be you, would you, in an honest moment, would you just simply put your hands out in front of you like you're going to receive something? I know it may sound silly, you being at work and watching this video in the break room, or, or, or maybe in your own home as your kids play around you, but would you just simply put your hands in front of you, and would you just pray this simple prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, come on, you can repeat after me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. I pray today that you would forgive me of all my sin. And Lord, help me to follow you. Jesus, 
I say, today, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Now, Father, for those who have said that prayer and meant it in their heart, Lord, I I pray today that, Lord, may you impact them in ways they never thought possible. Lord, in the midst of their interruption, in the midst of the things that are crashing down around them, may they feel your presence. Not flippant words that people just throw out, oh, you're going to make it, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Lord, no, may they hear an honest word that, Lord, you you never want to leave them nor forsake them. Lord, Lord, you want to become a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Lord, you want to move their life in such a way that they can never deny nor never refute that you are moving in their life. Lord, it doesn't mean that tomorrow morning when they wake up, COVID-19 is going to disappear. It doesn't mean that when they wake up tomorrow, they're going to have their job and they're going to have a raise and everything's going to be perfect and their kids are going to go back to school. But what it does mean that no matter what interruption they face, you will still help them through it to the very end. And Lord, for that, I give you great thanks, great glory, and great honor. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. If you have made that commitment today, would you, seriously, would you just click on that button there on online.church, or if you're on Facebook, would you just send a a real quick message, or or maybe even in the comments section here, if you'll just use lose your, lose your little emoji and just put your hand up we we want to co- connect with you we want to we want to get you some information about these next steps for following jesus in an incredible way the, the second part of this question and really it's more of a more of an introspection it, it's more of a, a moment where we reflect what god may be doing in our life have you used this time of hunkering down this time of seclusion and quarantine, have you used this time, for lack of a better term, selfishly? It's almost as if you said, it's me and my four and no more. I don't want to think about anybody else. And I, I, I get that social distancing, I, I get like we need to protect ourselves so we don't spread the virus. I'm not asking you to go cough and hug and kiss on everybody you meet. I'm, I'm just asking, have you, have you forgotten or maybe you don't, want it to know, you don't want to acknowledge that ministry is had in the midst of the interruption. Maybe today you're a parent and you haven't pondered maybe you're supposed to be ministering to your kids. Or, 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 or maybe you're an older person that lives by themselves and you've got some disposable income. And maybe, maybe you've pondered helping someone, but you haven't stepped out. Can I, can I encourage you today that interruptions are your ministry? That you need to be able to be used by God. And when we're interrupted in our life, really what that is, is a moment for us to reflect, stop, pause, and say, okay, God, what, what do you want to do? God wants to use you today to minister. You may say to yourself, Pastor, it's just, it's just crazy right now. Well, yeah. Paul had some kid fall out of a three-story building. I would, I would think that'd be a little crazy. But that was ministry. It was ministry to such an effect that it changed that boy's life forever, but it changed that whole town's life forever. Maybe this is the very season God wants to use you to do incredible things so that Jesus can be glorified and things will never be the way that they used to be. Why? Because interruptions are ministry. So here's here's my request. I'm going to pray, and here's here's my plea, my begging, whatever drastic word you want to insert there. Would you honestly consider who the Holy Spirit is laying in your heart today. Now, my, my, my hope, my prayer, my belief is, even if it's your own child, you pay attention to the Holy Spirit. So I'm going to pray, and as that name and face drops into your, your mind, would you make it a point to do something today? Don't wait till Monday. Don't wait till Tuesday. Don't wait till Wednesday. Do it, do it today. Call them up. Text them deliver groceries, uh, take a bag of Fruit Loops. I, I don't care what you do. Would you just do something? Let your interruptions become your ministry.
I'm praying that the Holy Spirit would interrupt you in this moment to give you a divine ministry opportunity. Father, I pray today for every person who has paid attention long enough to the service that, Lord, they haven't fallen out of a window and died. Oh, Lord, I pray that as they've heard a, a message about letting interruptions be our ministry, Lord, may we understand in that moment the impact that can be. Lord, the person that we've been called to minister to, that Lord, their life can be so transformed that they can never be, a, never be the same again because of your love that's been expressed in the midst of our own interruption. So Holy Spirit, I pray, I ask, I believe that at this very moment you're speaking a name and a face to people on the interwebs today. Lord, I pray that even before I'm finished speaking, Lord, a name and a face is brought to mind. And Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to convict our church. Lord, I pray you would convict our community. Lord, I pray you would convict our ecclesia. That, Lord, we have a job, and that's to do the ministry of the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, by whatever means necessary, the message of who Jesus is will never change. But our means, Lord, it will always change. And so, Father, may we do the ministry in spite of the interruption. Lord, for that, we give you thanks, glory, and honor. In your name we pray, amen and amen. Would you just solidify this moment with some worship, more worship today as our team continues to play and sing?
Thanks again so much for worshiping with us this morning. Uh, we do want to give you an opportunity to give if you'd like to give online. And so you can go to securegive.com. You can download the Android or iOS phone app called Secure Give. Or probably my favorite way to give right now is through text to give. You'll text the number 405 445 0319. Again, that number 405 445 0319. It'll take you through a series of prompts. You just type in the amount, hit send. It'll ask you to input your uh, debit information or credit information if you haven't done it before. And it'll send you back a text real quick. Hey, thanks for giving today at Chickasha First. We are honored that you chose to hang out with us this morning. It is a great privilege that we get to share in this online experience. I do want to remind you, our best days are still in front of us and not behind us. That Chickasha First will be a church where hope is found. And it's not done yet. God bless. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you all throughout the week on all our social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and everywhere else that you may see us. God bless. We'll see you then.